listening with you, yeah. talking about performance and JVM and so on and so forth. Brilliant. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Hello. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'll just start with the introduction. Uh, my name is William Loud. Uh, I have a company called J Inspired. I'm one of the founders. And mainly, I'm just the product architect. I do a lot of the research, um, and then typically develop these kind of solutions. We're focused on uh, application performance, uh, monitoring, and management. I'll, later on, I'll discuss the difference between what monitoring is and what management. But generally, it's confused in the industry when people say. I have an APM product, they're probably more likely they're saying I monitor my system with an APM product but they're not really managing it. I'll, I'll get to later on about what we mean by management and how it has to change. Uh, I previously worked for AT&T on network management, uh, least cost routing which is basically moving calls across a network in the cheapest way because we didn't always own the bandwidth, there was bandwidth issues and also we didn't own a particular leg on the traffic. Uh, I then worked also with Borland Software Corporation with the Borland products mainly on the enterprise area so VisiBroker, Borland Application Server, Borland... <laughs> <laughs> and then it was called Imprise Application Server, I don't know which one came first because we kept changing the name. So, But I worked with those products and and then I left uh, Borland. I, I, I originally had an idea to build a product, I think it was in 2000 called App Simulator and I pitched it to Borland and at that time they said to me Does it, is it called JBuilder App Simulator? and I said no it's actually not for JBuilder and they said oh if it hasn't got JBuilder on the name we don't want it here anyway so the product that I pitched was to take what we did with network management at AT&T and try to apply it to the JVM because at the future I felt that that we make calls today and just typically packet, packets across the network and I felt that eventually we were going to get to the stage with distributed computing that the way we manage those kind of networks will be the same techniques we will apply to software itself. So the new call management would be API calls. And I wanted to build products like QoS, which is typically used in network management, and apply it to application software. Of course, they said to me that that will be 10 years away. And I left because I said I can build it, and I'm still building it. So <laughs> they were probably right, that was 2000, so I'm still there. So anyway, the product was called App Simulator. Um, now, if you came here to learn you know, whether you should use which type of data structure you should use to optimize your application, that's not what we're going to cover tonight. I'm not going to look at how to optimize particular code or uh, which data structures you should apply. What I'm trying to do is to give you the theory behind how you go about measuring performance, how you go about understanding the measurement itself and eliminating noise from the measurement, and then how you go about changing the behavior of the software. Now that could involve tuning, but generally does in the kind of more enterprise space, it's not just about fixing the code, it's fixing how work is done within the application itself. Uh, whether you know, we have parallel, we, par you know, makes, uh, we execute the job across multiple processes <coughs> using you know, threads, or we split it up in different ways. So I gotta look at that, and then also how do we coordinate that, because we can't have uh, threads just running around and consuming resources, so there has to be some coordination. Uh, I, I think the font is a bit too small in this one, but basically uh, this diagram here sees this there's a, you know, four areas that we have to be concerned with in the future. And the first one is the clouds. Cloud computing is coming and it's really changing the way we approach how we build software in terms of both its, its, its resilience, its workload management, resource management. Uh, then there's also, and also provisioning, dynamic provisioning. And then of course we have sea of change. Now sea of change means there's a lot more change where people are doing continuous deployment. They're releasing versions, you know, multiple times a day. So how do you do? How do you manage a system that's really not manageable at all because everything is changing? So every time you, as an operations person, you try to understand what you're looking at, you really haven't got a picture because the picture that you probably had is already out of date. 
uh, because someone's already changed something. So you're not sure what you're really looking at. What you're looking at, of course, you can you're looking at an observation, but you don't understand the underlying model or what the state was at that time. So C of change is rapid changes within application itself. And then, of course, there's parallel processing. We have lots more cores coming along. How do we use, how do we break up our jobs and, and partition the work across those? And, of course, how do we coordinate then when the work has to be joined back together? Uh, then the other thing is pillars of platform. We're looking at, uh, you know, people are looking at platforms or languages. I, I wouldn't, like the JVM itself is a platform in some way, but you know, when people think of cloud, they probably think of like platform as a service. But really it's much more, I'm saying general, that we're looking at new programming models to help us work in the cloud, handle sea of change, and also make it easier to do parallel processing. And these kind of pillars of the platform are typically like actor-based systems, packet systems, which are really were probably the inspiration behind actor-based systems like ACA and all. So when it comes to performance, uh, there's a bit of a history to it. Uh, I, people probably can't see this, but like, will I change the resolution a little bit? Will it work? I don't know. No, uh, don't we, know. Have, uh, we have screens everywhere. Oh, you have screens in it? Oh, yeah. sorry. I didn't know. Um, <laughs> okay, that's very good. So, okay, so this is kind of a timeline of how we've come to in terms of application performance and engineering or management or monitoring. And so we initially started with the client server computing, and typically we had basic monitoring, which is taking some metrics for some server and pulling them together and putting them in some kind of dashboard. Uh, then we moved on to more diagnostics. People start want they had limited uh, success with metrics, so people wanted to go beyond metrics. The typical metrics were the le legacy applications uh, that we got from HP and IBM, but people wanted diagnostic systems. And generally, diagnostics are much more moving towards what the developer wants. Is what's happening now? Stack dumps, you know, like call stack dumps, uh, state dumps, heap dumps. Uh, so this is more diagnostics, and also diagnostic, diagnostics in terms of what was the request doing, what were the parameters. So we moved to that phase when, once we start getting, we start moving to distributed computing. Of course, the problem with diagnostics is you get lots of data, but you can't make, you know, it's very hard to make sense of it. You can get lots of transactions that are breaching some server's level agreement, but you then have to look at each little kind of diagnostic snapshot and make sense of it. So the industry then, of course, came up with analytics. Let's take the diagnostics and let's run some kind of inspections against these diagnostics and then try to determine what the problem is. And then, of course, what we got was these kind of simple applications that said, you've got a CPU problem. <laughs> or, you know, like you're, you're, you're running low on memory or your working capacity for memory is, you know, is, too, you know, is too high in terms of what the setting is. So they were very primitive, but we did have some kind of analytics for a while. And what we're moving, of course, then the industry started looking at more the grid computing. Of course, grid was always there, but it became a bit, bit more mainstream. And in grid computing, we, we focus on optimization. How can we take a job, and where can we deploy it on a network? And we have to be costed, we have to optimize both in terms of <coughs> cost, the latency of the job, and the resources that we have. So we have to look at the, you know, what resources that we have, how can we get the best utilization, how do we move the job around? What kind of transfer function? Typically, transfer functions like when do I decide to move the job off this node and onto another node because I need to meet a deadline? So in grid computing, we started to look at job optimization: how to make a job run fast, run faster within a time window, or how to uh, you know reduce its cost in some ways because you know there will be transfer costs. With utility computing, which is very very much like what cloud is. We're looking at more. We're looking more adaptation. Uh, utility computing is how can the application itself change itself to suit the environment, uh, which is like in cloud computing. We can certainly have additional capacity. We can add more nodes into a cluster, and we can add hundreds of nodes in, into a cluster. But can the software itself adapt to that? Can it run in a you know, a smaller capacity environment and suddenly dynamically change. And it might even request those resources. It might say, I can't do my job, so can I provision another server and move some of the work over there? So that's where the system has to adapt both to the environment and to the workload. So sometimes with the workload, 
it's trying to change its environment or trying to change itself. And typically, of course, if it can interact with its environment, it's trying to make it cozier. So adaptation, we're focused, really, we're coming into. So cloud computing is, is looking for us to start to make our software a bit more intelligent, to go uh, more than just I do a request, but I look at what I do, I understand how I did it, I try to figure out how I can do it better, or I try to figure out why I didn't meet some service level agreement or why I didn't give you a good service and then I try to adjust the next time I do this and that's where we're moving to cloud. Cloud is looking more for that. We have to do that because there's simply no way to manage this kind of system if we have to go in and manually change the software every time someone adds a new node or a new servers in there. Now to do that what we our view is that there has to be two things that have come along we have to have a new way to measure software to, to probe its software and understand the essence of the execution behavior. So we have to figure out, the software has to, some way, figure out what do I do? Other than, because typically, of course, a code just says, I call to the next method in my chain. But what does the next method do? It doesn't know that. It just says, well, I hope it does what I ask it to do, because that was, this, that was what the method says it does. But it doesn't understand how that particular method that it's calling implements its functionality. And for adaptation, we start to, we need more awareness of what everything else is doing to understand where we need to change. So we need a way, and this is what we call intelligent activity metering. And I'll come to what, the, we'll come on to that. Then the other part is then self-regulated software. The software, it's no point in measuring and saying, okay, that's what I do. How do I change that? So we need a mechanism where we get the software to start changing its behavior based on its observations it's made. There's no point in observing something and not acting on it. Of course, unless you're meeting, unless you're satisfying the service that you're requested to deliver, if you're, if you're not satisfying that, you have to re resolve it. Now, self-regulation means that the software is doing it, not you. It doesn't mean just, I know you're deploying every hour, and then you're probably trying to change the code and say, it's adapting, because I'm changing the code. But the software will have to start to do that, to really get to the level. Now, of course, for those two, what really connects the two of them is what we call feedback systems. In every engineering, control engineering, there's always a feedback mechanism. Feedback mechanisms is basically, I look at the observations, I take action, I look at the, action, the results of the action, I, which via, typically via the observation again, and I see whether the observation has resulted in a change. If it hasn't resulted in a change, I try something else. Okay, so that's a big picture. That's where we're going to go to. Now what we're going to build up to that is how do we get to there? What are the foundation or what are the steps that the, the software is going to have to do? Because we've reached the limit with the JVM itself. The JVM is not going to get much faster anymore. And you can see this, I mean, there might be some optimizations. I mean, the hardware has reached this limit. The JVM will probably already get like 10 or 20% improvements every year, but we're not going to get major significant improvements. The improvements are going to really come up into the application stack. And this is where we're getting more of the libraries to help us write more parallel, you know, concurrent processing uh, software. So they're already indicating that really the ownership or the responsibility now for performance optimization has come down to us. They've reached the limit in how they can optimize the system itself. Now the JVM is an adaptive system because what the JVM does itself is when it looks at your code, it measures your code, determines the frequency of its execution, and then decides whether it should you know, optimize it. And it typically is turning it into native code and then further optimizations there. And it does that over time. And then when it detects that that optimization wasn't maybe valid or some of the assumptions behind the optimi optimization have been invalidated because of new code paths, then it removes that code change, the adaptation of where it's still our code, but it's in the optimized form. It changes the optimization and, re and, and, and tries it again. A new optimization is placed in it. That's an adaptive system. Now, of course, in terms of our code, it's not really adapting. You know, our code is still the code that's running. The bytecode is there. But in terms of the native code compilation, that's adapting over the run. So the JVM itself is already a quite a, a very adaptive system. Now, what, happen, what we have to do 
is take the techniques that they apply and bring it up into the application stack. So that for, and then typically, of course, that means our software has to start learning what it does, observe itself, and then use those observations to change itself. Now, to get there, the big problem is we have to start with data because we have to understand our system. We have to understand what signals are important to my system. If you, if you went out for a jog and, and you're, you're running quite hard, what, how would you know that you probably should stop? Or how, you, of course, you, you generally, after a while, you start panting and, and you start to slow down. But what signals are you looking for? And now, well, what is your system doing? Because your system will typically slow you down anyway. It's whether even if you think you can run farther, further, you probably won't because your, your, your body itself is adjusting. And it's saying, I can't keep on this at this workload rate. So we already have typical systems and we look at ourselves, that, like we look at the temperature, our heartbeat rate. These are signals that tell us something about what's happening at this moment in our system. And we adjust accordingly. We take that feedback or we take the feedback. Some, sometimes it's not directly the feedback itself. We, we, we're not monitoring a heartbeat. Not all of us, at least, anyway. We're not monitoring a heartbeat when we're running. But when we start to pant or start to go, we probably need to say, okay, now it's time to stop. Now, indirectly, there was many other signals that came before that, before we actually got to that particular mechanism, which is trying to indicate, you know, to slow down. And so what we need to do is for software itself to have that kind of mechanism of or how that... that that process or method of how it determines which signals or which metrics or which measurements are indicative of good performance or, or indicative I'm just about to break, you know, to, for resilience. Now, of course, we have lots of data, so we could instrument the whole of the application and every code gets, you know, measured. But we have a lot of nice. And that would be like me huffing up every single vein in my body and saying, let's measure the blood flowing through it. That's probably overkill. I probably don't really need to, to do that to get a sense of my health status. So what we need the system is to, is to figure out which, how, do, how do I determine the critical or the key performance indicators which I should monitor and ignore the rest. So... We have data, now when we look at data, think of data as in measurement data, I, I always try to, it's best to picture in terms of at least uh, temporal aspects and, and, loca and, and location. So the typical approach today with data is, you probably create an M-beam, someone you know, with some kind of metrics, you, let's say you, write a, you wrote a queue system, and you have probably number of items in the queue, and the number of items you've processed, you know, you know it's a cumulative counter. And you probably publish that as an MBN, and then some other tool is hooks up into the MBN and then pulls it and stores it in a database. And this is what we typically call remote uh, uh, data, monitoring data, where you're taking the data, it's pulled somewhere, or it's even in log, and it's written to a log system, and no one ever looks at it again until there's a problem, and then you go you go through, you know gigs of logs just to try and find a single record that actually has meaning for you. The problem is that the data depreciates. Most logs, will, once they're probably not lo looked at in, within the first hour or within the first day, they're probably ne never looked at again. But we, we generate a lot of this data. And that's what we call is remote data. Now, part of that is that when we take observations, we also have to understand the temporal aspect, which is I've, I've got past, present, and predicted. I want to know, I, prediction is basically I want to know what I'm just about to do. Um, now, pass would be, I just made a measurement, and I'm either publishing it to a remote server, or it's just within the JVM itself, but it hasn't been collected, and I'm holding it there. And that could be just where, what you've just done. Like, what was the last request that you just did for a user? What was the res response time that you gave? Present behavior would be, what am I currently doing? Now, that would be, what, what threads within the system are currently running. So typical present data would be someone does a stack dump. That's a, that's a typical, what's happening now? That's the present. And then of course, then we have to predict it. And now what we want to predict it is, what am I going to do next? Now you're probably thinking, how can you predict what's gonna happen next? 
Well, I'm not talking about in terms of a user sending another request. I'm not, or sometimes you can predict which request is going to come next from a user's uh, steps in an application. But generally what I'm talking about is where the code is currently and what is more than likely going to happen next. Now we do that, the JVM, the hotspot does that today with methods that are calling to other methods and we typically call that a call site. And so it knows is either this method is going to be called or that method is going to be called. It's typically too loaded. And then of course if more get loaded or it's possible that there's uh, more overloading, then generally then it'll validate that. But generally the, the JVM is trying to shortcut where is the method going to go next. Now what we have to do is look at our software and figure out what am I going to do next. And when this request comes in, will I go to the database? Or how far am I in my processing? Have I already done my database work and have I to do my messaging work? How can this software learn from that? Now, how it can learn from that is by looking at its you know, previously profiles of what it did. Now, what it, I don't mean as in terms of what did the, the developer profile last week. I mean that the software looked at the last request and, look, and then looks at the current request that it's servicing matches it, says this is very similar, what am I going to do next? So, and look at what steps were performed in the last one and what steps are more than likely going to happen next. And that's where it's trying to predict. Now the reason why we want to predict is because we want to reserve ahead. Generally, to get more optimization and control of the system, we have to reserve resources ahead of time. We want to look ahead and say, well, I'm going to go to the database. And let's say the database had just say someone wrote a connection pool that only had one connection in it. If I'm just about to make that connection state, or I'm in a, pro, I'm a request, and I know the next part is going to be the database part where I load it, I want to reserve ahead and say, give me the connection. I want to reserve it. Don't let anybody go in there because I'm already halfway through my job. I want to finish. But of course, for the software to know that, it needs... It needs, well, for the software to do that, to actually do a reservation, it needs to know what it would, what it needs to be able to predict it. And it needs the previous behavior to, to know that, the observation. Now, the problem is that we do today, the big problem in the industry is this big black hole, is that all of your data is typically sent to another server. It's written to a log file or it's put, put on an MB and pulled into some management server. Now, where do you think the data would be more relevant? Would, within the application itself. But the application rarely consumes its own measurement data. How many of you have written an application that looks at its own measurement data and adjusts itself? Okay, we'll ask you questions later. <laughs> you can come up and do a presentation later on your case study. Well, so there's not many. Most of us don't do it. The data is typically, oh, that's someone else's uh, responsibility. Someone's going to consume that. I just publish it. But that data has actually more value local. And local because the, the local we keep it, because we know data depreciates very rapidly, especially as it loses, it goes from a remote system. The more local means is the lower the resolution or the time it's most recent. And then we can start to adjust at that moment. So we want to keep the data local. We want to have present behavior and not just stack dumps. Uh, and we want to be able to use that to predict where we're coming next, what's going to come next. Okay, now when we look at models, uh, generally what people do is say, I have an information model. An information model, oh, there's a big circle here, you, you just can't see it, oh, at least on the, not on this screen. But there is a circle here, and this represents the information model. And generally, what we want in the information model is the part of the, which is the management model. It's the part that has more meaning. It's the part that we can use to drive our action, actions, which will alter the behavior of the software. So we have, we have to figure out what's, what's, what part of this information model, which is huge, is relevant to the system itself. And so the, the, kind of, the goal is to figure out what the management model is. So how we do that, we start with measurement. Now the, the, tip, the two approaches we have currently, well we've got the metering, but the, the typical approach today is the metrics, which is someone has a metric like a counter or a gauge. Uh, the metric is sampled every one minute or one second. 
and it's stored somewhere, and it's typically at the process level because typically it's published as an mbean uh, or pub, uh, published somewhere, but generally with a process ID. And then, of course, what happens with that metric is we try to look at other metrics because we want to understand the relationship between one metric and another. So when GC is up, what, what makes GC spike? Or when the CPU spikes, what other metrics were spiking at that time or might not be spiking because it could be the inverse? So generally what we try to do is use statistical correlation to figure out we're probably concerned about one particular metric and we want to know the other metrics which are the drivers to it. Because GC is not, you know, is not the problem. The problem is someone's allocating. So we always want go to go back to the cause. We, we, what we're seeing is the effect of that action. But we always want to work our way back to the actual action itself or the cause, you know, the chain of actions that led to that. Unfortunately, with metrics, we can't really do it. Typical for assignment where we try to take a metric, let's say there was two or three tasks running at that time when there was a spike in the CPU. Generally, someone will say, well, let's apportion one third to this one, one third to that one, and one third to that one. It's what very, very much like what thread samplers do today, call stack samplers. They look at the threads, they take a sample every you know, 10 milliseconds, and then whatever thread was doing work at that time gets ticked. And everybody's getting an apportioned of that time. And really, where you, whether you were really doing something is, you know, is, not, is not actually factored in. So it's not, it's not quite accurate. It's not accurate at all. Now, what we, what we want to do is, in terms of metering, is this causality, where is that we only attribute, we measure at the activity level. What we want to know is what activity causes a metric to happen. So take, let's take example CPU. Today we can get the CPU for both the process and the thread level. So at the thread level, the, when we have a CPU at the thread level, we can relate it back to the actions that the thread do, did itself. So if the thread was executing a method and the thread CPU time was increased, the cumulative, because it's a typically a counter, then we can say that this method caused the CPU to the CPU consumption for this particular thread to increase by this amount. Yeah? So the importance there is we know for sure that the, the activities on this call stack are the ones that caused the, tr the consumption of a particular important metric or measurement. So this is what we want. We want the uh, cause and effect. So, and it's event based. So when a method starts, typically, typ it's probably best to see it as like an old billing system or metering system. Someone comes to your house, they, they read your, your meter at the beginning of the month, and they come back at the beginning of the next month and they read it again and the delta is how much you consumed in your home on, on the utility meter. And, that's what, and that's what, this is what this does is where the event itself is, is the execution of an activity or a method and it reads the meter and then reads it again and says this method caused this to happen. Now it's at a thread level so meters have to be thread specific. So if you have a counter you have to have a at a process, you typically have it at the process level, but with metering, you have to have the counter at the thread level itself. So every time something happens, it's a counter. You increment the thread, like think of it as like a thread local. You increment that counter. Now, if you increment that counter, then all of the methods on the call stack, which were present at that time the counter is incremented, will be apportioned that cost. Now, of course, one of them will be direct, because he's the guy that's the immediate, the last caller. And then everybody else up the chain can say, well, I indirectly caused that unit of consumption to happen or that counter to be incremented. And it's direct assignment, so we don't have to worry about apportioning. Now, typically what we do for that, to get this kind of mechanism, what we have to have is, in metering systems, they always have a, a kind of a probe where something is measuring on a line. And I, I, when I started programming, I had to build a weight bridge system. And a weight bridge system, I don't know if anybody knows what a weight bridge system is, but it's a truck that goes across a kind of a bridge or a piece of concrete, and underneath that is a weighing scale. And it goes over, stops, and then it goes into the, into the yard, empties its payload, and comes back out, and we measure it again. And whatever is the difference is what they just dropped off. Yeah, so we take the payload, we can determine the payload of a big truck by simply weighing it as it enters the, the you know, the... Um, the factory, and then as it leaves, we know what was deposited. 
So that's what, and that's typically done by a probe. The probe says, I'm going to measure, I'm going to weigh, and then I'm going to weigh again. Now, of course, the, the probe will have to measure something, and that's what we call is a meter. So it has to say, I'm going to, I'm just about to start something, let me read your meter, and now I'm going to finish it, let me read it again. Now, a typical meter is like a counter. It increments, it has to grow all the time. It can't go up and down. Because if it went up and down, and we read at one stage where it was up high, and then it went down, and then went back up again, what was actually changing? So we, we, the meter itself has to be a cumulative, like a counter. And what we typically do is apply the probe as a, to code, which says, okay, this method is executing, and it represents behavior. Now this is important because there, in an event system, there's a cause and effect, and they're basically two events. But you have to model one as, as generally you have, a, you have a decision where you model, model it as an activity, or you model it as a resource. So a method executing, you might just simply, I, I'm going to increment the counter. And another method executing, you might say, I'm going to read all the meters, and then going to read them again and determine the consumption. And that's what we call is an activity, being metered. So that's behavior, that's more interesting, and this is usage itself. Uh, I, I'm going to show an example of what that means, because it's probably a, a bit fluffy at the moment for you in the head. So, but when we come to the measurement of the systems, there's three functions all application performance management products have to do. They have to instrument some code, and that could be manual or could be done dynamically with an agent. And then when the code is, the instrumentation is in there, what the instrumentation does is it reads something, doesn't it? What's, what, the, what does your instrumentation look like today? It's probably like start with system dot curtain time milliseconds or nano time. Yeah? Okay, so what's that? That's actually instrumentation plus measurement, yeah? Because we're doing, I put the line in called system dot nano time. And then I put it in again, and then, and so that's the measurement. You measure the delta, so you do the two instrumentation lines. You take the measurement difference, yeah? And what do you do? What's collection? What is the typical collection done by the vast majority of people? Logging. System L or logging. I take that number and then I write it to a log. And that's what we call data collection. So instrument, put the code in there, measure it and collect. Now, most people will do that all together. They, whatever the instrument is what they measure, especially if it's only system nanotime because you just decided what it is. And then generally, you don't look at the number, you just write it out. How many people actually looked at the number and said, is this worth writing to the log file? No, you just write it out because you, you don't know. You just said, I don't know what the number should be right or wrong. What is the number size? Because I haven't a clue. That's why I'm putting the code in there in the first place. So if you actually knew the time or you, you knew what the performance objective is, you probably would you know, say, I'll, if, if it's this value, then I will not write it to the log file because their log write takes this amount of time. But you don't know how long, how, how long it takes to do a log write, and you don't know what your typical range for your method is, and of course you don't know what's important to the developer. That's the problem with inst manual instrumentation, is that you have, you have to have some intelligence put in, but you haven't got that at that moment because you're, you're writing code that's static. There's nothing on the editor that tells you the method, anything about the method. It doesn't give you a cost profile. It doesn't tell you how many times it's going to execute in production. You just write the lines in there. And then later on, just look at the log files and say, well, that's a bit too big, isn't it, all those log files? Now, what we need to do is, is for instrumentation, we instrument, and then for the instrumentation to decide whether it continues to measure. So what the instrumentation has to do is to adaptively say, hey, I'm not going to measure anymore because this method is just too cheap. It has no value. It's too, you know, it executes too quick. Or if I keep measuring it, I'm going to slow everything down. And then if it doesn't measure, or if it does decide to measure, it might decide not to collect it, because collection has a cost. It might say, okay, I did measure it, but that wasn't a good one. It was too cheap. I shouldn't have probably done it, but I did, So, but I'm not going to write it. So what we want the software for a typical performance management product, and it's very adaptive, is to change these, to break them apart, and not have it to be instrument, measure, and collect. Okay, this is where I write some code, because I was missing it. <laughs> it's like, come on, get to the code. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm just.
just, we're go uh, can everybody see the code? Yeah? So, we're going to look at a piece of code. I really, I'm going to change the font on this one. Sorry, just to increase it. I'm gonna try and I can't type with just one hand. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna look at some code here and then we're going to apply the kind of what I talked about in terms of activity and measurement, just to see what that means. Uh, and again, this is the build up that we have our, we're gonna later on get to how we adapt the co you know, adaptation happens in our code and how do we observe. Generally the first part is how can we get rid, rid of nias in the model? Because we can't just measure everything. So we have to be, you know, in some ways intelligent about that. Now what intelligent means is, a, of course, a different question, is what's relevant. Generally we look at what's relevant to this, uh, this software itself. Or the accuracy of information. So if we think about information quality, we have to understand whether did we, is the data that we collect accurate or not. Now, let's just look at the JVM, how it adapts itself. So I'm going to, if you look at this method here, wrong. Uh, does anybody know how to optimize that code? Uh, let's start with that. I want you to optimize call because I found that the call is the bottleneck in the system. Okay, we'll come back to that, so don't worry. But generally, if you were to use a sampling tool, it probably would tell you that all you're doing is making call. You're making the call to the call method itself, yeah? Okay. Not it's not, of course, it's not doing anything, but it's still, that's where it would happen, yeah? But it, that's just so, well, I, I, we're coming back to why that is. So let's look at just the, the JVM itself in action with this. I'm just going to check that I have it right now. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're, yeah, that's what I'm going to show. So if we run that, if we run that now, it should, if I haven't done, I'm not running with the instrumentation, hopefully. Uh, no, I don't want to instrument, hold on. Uh, so I'm just got to run it now. So if we run that, I think it's got, I'm going to just one, use one thread, just to make it easier for us to see. <coughs> Uh, I've got to run it a little bit longer, <laughs> uh, a few times, hold on. I'm going to move the instrumentation down, this code here. I've got to run the test method itself, so we're just going to run this test and put it here because we'll see this in the, let's put it into the wrong. So this is your typical instrumentation, yeah? So we're going to, your manager says, I want you to optimize this particular code, and you're going to optimize it here, or you're going to figure, first of all, you'll, you'll go about trying to determine how long it takes. And then we're going to print that out. <coughs> I should have changed this code. Many times did I execute that? The run count. So your typical will be then the end and the start. And then we'll, that's divided by the, the run count because we just want to know the average cost. Yeah? Uh, just get rid of all of this sort of stuff there. So if we do the, the run again, uh, and I'll run it a few more times, run count, uh, test count, I'll run it 10 times the test count. You can see it goes to zero. 
Yes? Yeah. So what's happened is that the the JVM eliminates this method, realizes it's not doing anything, inlines it up or eliminates it completely, then realizes that this actually is not doing much, and then the, the, the loop is not done at all. And all we do is actually do start and and print out. Yeah? Now, if we apply a measurement tool, so let's say in a typical instrumentation, the best instrumentator or the best tool out there that are the least work it could do and have to do this, start. So you come along and you say, I'm going to instrument this method because this is the bottleneck. <laughs> of course, there's nothing there, but this, that's the whole point. So you're going to do that. That's what your profiler would do, wouldn't it today? At least, it has to do that. And then it would have to take it away and then write it somewhere or store it in the system. This is the minimum. I mean, no, I mean, it couldn't get any cheaper than this, but it doesn't really do much. And the system is is much lower now. And typically the 72 is because we're doing two nano clock time reads, yeah? So we perturbed the system now. We previously we had zero, and now we have something that's coming out with measurements of 71 on the method itself. Yeah? At least the average. And of course the run method itself is now altered drastically. The run method would have been very quick before, and now it's slow, and all because not because of it but because we instrumented a method it calls. So what we want to do is for the system to dynamically determine I shouldn't measure this method because it's too quick. Now, of course, we can't just say anything that's zero. So somehow the intelligence can't just look at the bytecode and say, okay, whether I should do it or not. It needs to use its own measurement to decide whether it should continue. So let's look at, so this time I'm going to, inst I'm going to actually instrument it with our uh, adaptive system. Now I'm not here to do a product pitch, I'm here just to show an example, example of what adaptive mechanisms look like in practice. So we've got, we're going to measure the system, uh, so I'm going to instrument it, so I'm going to say instrument samples. Now initially I'm going to run it without any strategy. Now what I'm going to do is a typical what would look like for a profiler. So this is what a profiler will do. So I'm going to run it. And I should, I did take out the clock times, did I? Oh, I should take these out. I'm adding, I'm running it twice now. <laughs> Let's just do this. So a typical profiler will instrument that. So I'm going to instrument the call method. It's, it's empty now, but we're going to put in bytecode dynamically as it loads. And we're not going to use any strategy, so we're going to be pretty dumb about it. So we're going to be at least more than 70 on that because we have to do something. We have to measure it and, and store it somewhere. Oh, I shouldn't have a customer's license key there. <laughs> I better change that. <laughs> so we're up to 185, yeah? So that's what the measurement. So the measurement is this is a typical cost there. I just hold on a second, I have to fix something. <laughs> okay. So that's a typical measurement there, we were measuring it. Now I should I'll just do that quickly again just to show you. So we were measuring it. Okay, let's go. Now if I stop it, just to show, because you're probably saying was it measured, if I drop it now, I've stopped it and I'll see an XML file. Well I've turned off the console so we don't have a connection. So by default it will import some output some XML. So what's happening here is we're outputting the metering profile. So this is the process level metering, which is the aggregation. And we can see that uh, the call method here samples that a call. It's a probe, and we're measuring the clock time meter. And this is the number of times we measured the meter, and this is the total time that's being performed. You know, we've accounted for. That's the total clock time that's being consumed. Yeah. So that's why we're slow because we're measuring it. Of course, I, I have I killed it before. It didn't do its completion. So what we want the system to do is say, use that measurement that you have, and don't instrument that method anymore or dynamically remove the, the instrumentation itself. So if I take off the strategy, if I, if I put back in the strategy, strategy, which is on by default,
we get back down to quite low figures there. And actually it will get cheaper. I think if I go to Java 7, I think it should go much cheaper. A little bit. You should typically get to zero. I think I have to run it a bit more. But what's happened there is that we optimize our code and eliminate the instrumentation itself, or part of the instrumentation. And then what happens then itself is that the hotspot itself looks at that code that we've altered and then removes our code itself. And then generally it comes down back down to a zero overhead cost there. So we will come back down to what the JVM itself looks like. And what's happened there, if we look at the XML files that's been outputted, is that in the, in the group where we look at the method for sales samples a call, what we have here is it's a probe, but we've disabled it through. And what's happened is we've done it at the count 1000. So what the system does is very much like what Hotspot does. Hotspot looks at 10,000 method. It looks at the uh, when, a, when a method executes 10,000 times and then applies optimizations. What we do is we look at the measurement after 1,000, and then we look at the cost in the measurement and the measurement itself, the average, and then we decide whether we should continue to measure it, and we disable our instrumentation. Yeah. So we're adapting by using the data. So this is a system where it's saying. I am a profiler, but I look at what I do, and I observe, I understand my cost, I look at the cost of what I'm collecting, or what I'm measuring, and then I use that to make a judgment, and then I change the code itself, or change my own instrumentation, and adapt the system. So that's an example of some feedback system in it. Does the, does the VM give you, export this kind of information, so you don't have to do the instrumentation yourself? No, no, we have to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And this for this for a profile, it would be a lot easier if it was there, to, you know, because the JVM just collects some information. Just but, but yeah, but let's say you weren't optimizing, the meter wasn't just a count or the clock time. Let's say it was CPU time or some other counter. So you can use the same system to say I want to optimize any uh, a method and uh, and use another type of counter to eliminate code itself. Okay. Okay, so in the system there, what we had is, and I, of course, if I, now, another thing part of was when you come to measurement. So let's say your manager says, okay, yeah, clock time, what about the CPU time? So you go back to your code, and then you, you had your system nano time. Remember your system nano time? And then your manager says, can you add in the clock time, or maybe read the GC time? So then you have to go to tr management factory, uh, get thread MX bean, get thread, CPU time, yeah? Uh, should we get current? Get current thread, CPU time, yeah? And of course you'll do that twice, yeah? Yeah, because you'll have to do that. So your manager says, oh, we don't, we're not concerned just with clock time, we want the CPU time itself. So then you go back and you have to change all the methods that have been instrumented and add in all this back in. Now, let's just look at what it looks like to the JVM itself, where we put that in, and I'm going to eliminate our instrumentation, so I'm not going to instrument it, and see it run. Now, I'm going to, uh, I know this takes a lot longer, so I've got to maybe just do tells me. We're reporting the average anyway. So I run the Java 6, this, by the way, I just, it's just the agents there. We're not actually doing any instrumentation. I've just disabled. So what's happened here is, now this is where we were previously back to 70. But now that we added in the CPU collection, we're nearly up to 2, two, two microseconds. This is nanoseconds, yeah? So we're nearly up to 2 microseconds. So we vastly changed the system by picking the wrong measurement. So measure, <coughs> it's not just only that we, what we measure. We also have to be concerned about what counters that we add in or what type of fields that we do because they can all have their cost. Of course if you have an adaptive system like what we could do is let's say the meter so we'll put in the meter and let's do it like CPU time include equals true. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna eliminate the instrumentation. Yeah okay. okay. Thanks. I'm going to go back and put that in. So this is what, what we were looking at already with the CPU time. So if I run that, 
we should get very similar to what we had. No, <laughs> there we go, zero. <laughs> Hold on. Um, yes. So I'll just uh, put in, I want the instrument samples, which is the code itself. We run it. Meter CPU time input. I don't think it's reading that CPU time. Oh, it did. Actually, what happened there is the CPU time was cheap initially. Our meter, our version of the CPU time was cheap initially, and we'd already disabled it by the time it got to a thousand. So that's why we were okay there. But the CPU time, of course, is a step function. Sometimes it can be cheap, and sometimes it's not. So I'm going to, I'm going to change the threshold. Sorry. On the hotspot threshold, and I'm going to warm up. So. I'm going to wait till it warms up for our tails and maybe, and that should, because I want it to be slow. <laughs> it's not going to be over me. <laughs> How are we reading that so fast? <laughs> We are measuring CPU times. I don't know how we're doing it much faster. I know we have some native code, but we shouldn't be doing it that fast. But <laughs> so that's one of those demo things. But it, we are measuring the CPU time there, but it's not perturbing the system as much as the, the management factory did itself. So uh, and we disable it too quick. Okay, so uh, particularly what you will do is put a sample in. So I go back to my slides. Oh. oh. Where am I now? Um, yeah, I'm just nearly there on this part. So, so that was an example of where we apply, where we measure something, what a probe we represent as a, as a method or a package or a class, and then we measure the meters, and then we try to adapt. We got an, an intelligent measurement system where it figure out, don't measure this because it costs too much to measure it and the value of it. So the re why are we doing that? It's not just to show you that we've done some fancy stuff. The reason we're doing that is because we want to figure out how to eliminate noise in the model. We can't collect everything. Now that's just a very simple example of a strategy. We have about 30 strategies and they're not related just to cost itself or how cheap a method is. So typical strategies we'll be looking at, if you have an application code today, you have container packages, your application server, you have your application packages and your third-party packages, the libraries that you're using. Now, you might instrument all of them, but the first probably thing you will do is, if you want your software to understand itself, you probably would only instrument the application package itself. So that's the first stage is where you, which you and you, you generally do that with a profiler, where you only, you pick your code base and you only instrument that. So that's a kind of like an intelligent, it's just saying what's relevant. So you're already doing it. It's, it's not dynamic because you're doing it in a configuration file. Now what we want the system, let's say then you have a lot of tiers in your system where you have your, your web, app, web tier, your process tier, your, maybe your business you know, workflow, some business logic and database tier. And you might say that I only want to measure as I go into these packages. Let's say I don't care about what happens inside of Hibernate, but I am concerned about as I call into Hibernate. So the part of where I call into Hibernate, the interface, I'd like to measure there. And I'd like to only measure the service calls in my application, which, you know, let's say this is the business of the workflow system and the component level. And maybe I only want to measure at the stop, of, at the, the, the stop part, you know, the entry point into my web, web tier. I don't want to measure every package inside of it. Now, of course, you can't do that because if you were to do that today in manual, what would you have to do? You'd have to run your system up, get a call tree, and then start going through all the methods and saying, there's a method, that's the package, okay? Now, any other method that that calls, I don't want to instrument. So you go into your filters file and exclude it. But what happens if later on that's an entry point, one of those methods that you called or you eliminated because it's nested, because you only want to measure here, if you eliminate this method, he actually might be an entry point elsewhere in the system. So you can't really do that. And it's, it's impossible to do it on any large code base. But what we would like the system to do is to determine that at runtime. Because it's the only way you can do it. So what we, what we can have is, is where we, def, we define a tier 
and say this is a tier called web and these are the packages that are part of the web package this is the, pro the workflow system this is the packages that belong to the workflow system and this is the you know, business logic, more component level business logic or validation rules and then this is the persistence tier and then what we want the software to then do is determine as the system is running to measure here but if this method calls these other methods to not measure those and the system can do that at runtime and then what happens is we only are only left with this system here and this gives us a workflow this gives us a kind of a, a, a you know a filtered view on how our application works we can see the calls across the particular tiers now a tier means whatever to you it is whatever packages that belong to it but that's a much better way of doing it now that's an example of an intelligent system where the intelligence can only be done at runtime and then it looks at a method and any method that's never you know gets disabled or doesn't get measured unless it's part of here unless it's at the edge if it's already inside of another method that's part of each of the existing tier it is then it doesn't meter it and that can be done that can only be done at runtime so they, these are the kind of things that we want the system to measure or to figure out how to do I'm nearly there just coming to the so what we what we start with when you come down to this now there's many different strategies that we want some some strategies are what we kind of do is try to inline calls like what the hotspot does today there's inlining and so if you know that one method calls another method and it's always this sequence then you you can actually only you can only measure the other method and you don't have to measure the inner method because you know that inner method is always called by this method so these are kind of optimizations that the hotspot does, but these can be applied up at the observation level to, to eliminate you know, the noise in the system itself. Now, but what we're trying to do is, is we start with this kind of big black circle where we're measuring everything in our system, and only this part is of real value, and we're trying to figure it out. Now, of course, we'll, in, in initial measurement, we'll start to see that this is useful, this data here, or this data represents you know, the performance. But the problem with this is, is that it's because we've instrumented so much, the data is corrupt. The data is not accurate, and we might not be getting the coverage itself. So what we want the system to do is to get more accuracy and maybe collect more data, but only when we've started to get, we started to eliminate some of the instrumentation. So what we really want the system to do is instrument everything, and then start re eliminating instrumentation as it measures and then, and then the, what is measured to start to gather more data about that measurement. So initially we might do something cheap. Now this is what the hotspot does itself. It does initial cheap profiling. So we initially do cheap profiling and then over time we start to do call profiling. Let's tip, cheap profiling would be like system nanotime, just measure the method. But what we want to do over time is to maybe get the call tree of who calls this method. But if we did that at the start and did it for every method, it would be huge. And the cost, would, it would change the profile. But if we initially use the cheap mechanism and then use that to drive, to increase the data collection as we start to eliminate or reduce our overhead, this is where we should be aiming for, where by the end of the system, or as the system is running, whatever we're measuring is what's relevant to the system. And we've eliminated as much overhead as possible in the measurement itself. And this is what we call intelligent measurement, is instrument, use that to drive adaption in the instrumentation, and then and use that then to collect more because we have a bigger budget. So if we eliminate overhead elsewhere by removing bytecode instrumentation, we can use that cost to maybe collect more data on the parts that we are measuring. And that's what a system should do. Now, finally, this is the last slide before the break. When we went back to that method itself, remember the methods that we had? Where we had the run method? So let's go, if we go back to this method itself. And I asked you to optimize that method. So, what's the first rule of performance engineering? Or what's the first rule of the performance optimization. What's your, what's your first thing you should do with code if you want to make something go faster? To remove it. To remove it. 
code that's deleted is as fast as possible. That's it. Uh, you know, of course, whether someone wants to do it or needs it, that's a different story. And it might be needed to actually for something else to be optimized. But there's nothing as fast as dead code or code that's being taken away. And so, if your manager asked you to optimize this, you would try to eliminate the code itself. Now, a hotspot's doing that. It's already eliminating it for you. But where would, how would you eliminate this? How would you eliminate that particular method other than deleting? You know, other than deleting. So if you were to say, I want you to optimize it, and you have to call has to be called. Where, where, where is the starting point to this? To fixing that code. If you looked at that code now and you just seen call, you'd say it's an empty method. Okay, that's great. But what's the problem? Let's say it was still slow. Let's say it was a little bit in here. Where, where's the problem really? Where's the problem? Is it here? Or is it above? Where would you fix it? Or did, let's say I told you you have to optimize this, but you, ha you have to keep that method there. Let's say some other method needs it. Where would you change the code? Where we're calling the method because what's the quickest thing to do is to change the run count. Don't call the database. We all know that everybody buys in it. It's like we know the database is slow. Why do you keep calling it? You know, that's a, if you buy an APM product today, all they do is the SQL analysis. Pretty much all they do. That's the first thing. They, everything else is just kind of like let's check that we got code instrumentation, but we know the database is all the bottleneck. Every case study I read from our competitors, all they say is we had an SQL problem. I was like, is anybody out there who doesn't have an SQL problem? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a tool for them. <laughs> so, but it's generally because you're calling. So what we can do to eliminate this work is to look above. Because what happens if we start to observe here is we change the behavior of the system. So when we come to, opti to performance measurement and optimization, if we get close to the bottleneck, so if we put in instrumentation into the call method, what happens? Everything goes slow, yeah? We don't want to do that. We want to figure out that what the cost is for run itself, that run is calling call. So when we look at performance of our hotspots, generally it's not, and every developer wants the a profiler to bring them to the line of code. That's the hotspot, but it's not. That's not where the hotspot is. The hotspot is always, or well, generally, is always above it. It's the guy that's calling it. So if you take the enterprise application, I can tell you today what the hotspot is. It's a database. <laughs> now, how do you? I can't make the data other than put fast equals true inside a database file, you know, or some any or any. I can't fix that. So what do you have to do? You have to change the caller. So. Generally, when you're looking at performance optimization, or in terms of Java itself, don't be trying to find the method itself, because the closer you get to the method, it's like a magnet. You're like kind of initially attracted to it, because you see, oh, there's the hotspot. And then you start to say, I've got to measure more. But as soon as you start measuring it, you start to get pushed back, because you're starting to perturb the system. What you have to be doing is measuring it from a distance where this part is where I still have the system running at full capacity, so I'm not perturbing the system, but this is probably where the area I should fix the system. So if we go back to the when we, when we instrumented, what happened in our system? We disabled the call method. Our intelligent instrumentation disabled the call method because it was too cheap. Now the run method was probably still being measured. Why? Because that's probably the location for where you should start your optimization. Not the, the call method, but you should be looking downwards there. So hotspot is here, but it's generally above here. It's the guys that are calling into the hotspot. So generally we try to avoid the hotspot, or we try either not calling in there because it's expensive, or by limiting our calls into, into that method itself. So optimization is focused really in this area here, is the optimal, what we call as the optimal tuning point within the system is don't tune the, in the code itself, tune just above it. Tune it in the workflow that's calling into the code itself. A typical sample give you a much higher level. Uh, I think that's it for this. Well, this is, I'll just make sure this, because I don't want to say that again, yeah. <laughs> this is the last slide. <laughs> so, just another example, let's say uh, in terms of measurement or optimization, is if you had a, if you had a call sequence like this, and you were calling down, you might give yourself a budget. 
when we do work today, you generally have a budget, and you might be you might have a budget say, okay, we'll continue developing this code, and we have a budget or a time budget or a cost budget, and once it starts to become too expensive, we stop. Yeah. Generally, I hope that's what the project will do. Like the manager will say, well, let's pull the plug on this project and let's bail out. Uh, but with budgeting, we can do that. We can apply budgeting mechanisms to measurement. So what we can do is we can give a, a budget to a measurement to a method here, a top method. So let's say a request comes in, we give it a budget. Now, of course, the question then is, what's the budget? So what do you do today when someone says to you, how long is it going to take to 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 finish this job? What do you do? You look at your previous jobs, or you just go, or you look at what you want to do. <coughs> Generally, you look at what you previously did. And you estimate, you you come up with an estimate. So what we can do here is for the for the profiler to look at the previous executions and say this generally this on average costs a hundred. And I'll get and I'll, okay, my measurement cost is one let's say one microsecond, and that's a hundred. So I can give it a budget. And if I want to keep my budget within two percent overhead, then I can give it two microseconds because this is a hundred. So I can say that this method takes a hundred give it two microseconds and go down. And then I come to another method, and I look at that method. Now I've already taken one unit, so I've taken one unit here, and I've given it because I've, I've, I've measured this method. And then I come down to this method because it's executing now. I look at its average cost, and its average cost is 60, and say, okay, I can give it a budget. Now the other guy has, a hundred, has already given a, a budget of two. He's consumed one, so there's one left, and I'll consume it here. And then I call to another method, and it, it might have like 50, which would give it a budget of one, when we talk about 2%, but I might have no more budget left, because the other two guys have used it in the measurement, and I might stop there. Of course, that diagram doesn't show that now, but what, what a budget system in an optimization can go down as, it, as we're measuring, the, as the code is executing, give a budget, and start adjusting, and then as soon as the budget runs out, stop measuring. So that's another kind of optimization and adaptation of the system itself, kind of dynamic. Okay, so that's, there's, there's many ways that we can approach this, and that's, that's the groundwork is that we first of all figure out how to get the data, measure it, and then how to use these kind of mechanisms like budget strategies, filters, or you know, understanding tiers, and to get down to the essence of the execution. And so the next part we have to then look at, okay, we know how to observe software, what do we do next? How can we slow it down, coordinate it, make something go faster than others? How can we control the software and stop it from running away? So in the next part, when we come back, if, you, if you're still here, <laughs> oh. <laughs> we will look at, we look at complexity. The complexity that's introduced when we talk about, when we go beyond monitoring and look at management. How can we make the software do something other than it does today and use the data and it change itself in ways? And not just about profiling. It's not about profiling if we just have to make software adapt itself. <laughs>